This episode is brought to you by Indie Film Hustle Academy, where filmmakers and screenwriters go to learn from top Hollywood industry professionals. Learn more at ifhacademy.com. I'd like to welcome to the show, Chloe Okuno. How you doing? I'm doing good. Thank you. Thanks How are so you much. doing? I'm doing I'm doing great. Thank you so much for being on the show. I, I had the pleasure of watching your new film, your new Sundance film, The Watcher, uh, today, and it was uh, it was uh, creepy. Uh, it was uh, pretty pretty creepy. So uh, we will get into it. But before we get started, how did you and why did you want to get into this insanity that is the film industry? <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, what a question. I've asked myself that question many times over the years. <laughs> <laughs> Questioning my decision to do this instead of going to law school. Um <laughs> So I, um, I'm from Pasadena, so I guess I grew up on the periphery of the business, but my family isn't in the business at all. Um, and I think when I was around in high school, I just, I loved movies and it was the only thing I was really passionate about. And I sort of started to, you know, consider the idea, which seemed very far fetched at the time of being a filmmaker. Um, because there were so many filmmakers who I just had completely fallen in love with. So, um, yeah, I think around high school, I, I thought about getting into the business. And I did like a a six-week directing course at the New York Film Academy where <laughs> they let us loose with like 16 millimeter cameras and like mm-hmm. four person crews. And none of us knew what we were doing. But they taught us the very basics of cinematography and film editing. Um, and I completely, you know, fell in love with the process of actually making movies. So, uh, yeah, it was, it was, it's been quite a few years now, uh, that I've sort of tried to make my way through this very difficult business. And was there a film that lit your fire to do this? Oh God, that's such a good question. I mean, I think there were probably quite a few. I'll be honest. I was a major Quentin Tarantino stan when I was in high school Mm -hmm. and I continue to think he's fantastic. So when I was, um, I was living abroad in France for like a year and it was kind of a terrible experience in a way. I was really lonely and miserable, but I went to see Kill Bill like seven times in the theater (laughs) and it just provided such a source of comfort and escapism. And I think like that sort of solidified for me the idea that this is what I wanted to do. That's well, it's not a bad movie to be inspired by. Uh, and and Quentin, Quentin has inspired a couple of filmmakers, not many, but a couple <laughs> over, <laughs> over the over the years. Now, I've noticed that from your filmography, you've kind of leaned towards the horror and suspense genre. Uh, is there a specific thing that kind of caught your eye, and why you kind of love, you know, telling stories in those genres? I think for me, it's just a particularly um, intense and therefore cathartic experience to be afraid and to get your heart rate elevated. And I just, I love, you know, filmmakers who work across the horror and thriller genres, you know, I like growing up Tarantino, but it was also David Fincher and the Coen brothers and John Carpenter and, you know, Toby Hooper and Wes Craven. And I just, I really fell in love with people who were able to um, make movies that like terrified me, but also energized me because I think just their filmmaking craft is for me personally, the most exciting. Yeah. Without, without question. Now you started off as a PA, like many of us do. Uh, and was there something uh, those, was there a time in, is there some, is there a question or excuse me, is there something that you wish someone would have told you some piece of advice back when you started this ridiculous, inve- <laughs> insane adventure of being a filmmaker? Um, because I say that because I say that with, I call it the beautiful d- disease, uh, because of the beautiful sickness, because it is, it's like, it's a sickness, but it's a beautiful one. It's the, it's the, the path of the artist. Um, but, it's insanity. We're carnies. I mean, we're essentially carnies. We went, we went off and joined the circus. <laughs> yeah, completely. Yeah, no, I mean, I think it, it is weird. I was thinking about, um, like, the, when I even first started making movies and how intensely stressful it was, but you even sort of fall in love with the stress, you know? You fall in <laughs> love with the highs and the lows, and you definitely fall in love, I think, with sort of, like you said, that carny lifestyle of, like, going from movie to movie and having these really 
you know, incredible like experiences with these people and then moving on to the next one. But yeah, I mean, I, I wish that, I don't know that anyone could have given me any advice that like would have persuaded me one way or the other, you know, I think in this you're in it and like, you just, you, you, as long as you continue to love it, you keep going. And I think there are a lot of people who ultimately get disillusioned with this business and why wouldn't they? Because it's just heartbreak after heartbreak after heartbreak. And I've certainly experienced that. I mean, I've been working, you know, since graduating AFI in 2014, I've had so many projects kind of fall through the way it, it shocking. happened. Shocking, shocking, shocking. Okay, I know. what a shock. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you really do, I think the other thing is like coming up with, you know, your f fellow um, filmmaking friends, you really see that this business is just, you're on a roller coaster. And sometimes people will have a very high moment in the, their careers and you'll feel very low by comparison. Oh. But then that verts immediately, you know? And I think it's just like, if, if there was advice, and I sort of just learned it by sticking with it for this long. But, you know, if someone had just sort of told me, like, just sort of ride the ups and downs because that is part of it, you know? Don't get discouraged too much. But at the same time, I certainly like have a hyper awareness that I need to enjoy this moment in which my career is going well. And I have a movie in Sundance because, you know, in a year from now, it could be a totally different situation. So I think you just sort of have to to keep going and, and try not to um, let it psychologically damage you permanently. <laughs> <laughs> because this is a thing that they don't teach you like at film school. They don't talk about this. This is not part of the curriculum very often. It, they teach you how to run a camera. They teach you how to work with an actor. They teach you how to light something. But they don't teach you about the realities and the hardships and the resilience that is needed. And I know you know this as well coming up. There are people, you know, colleagues of yours that you look at and like, how are they directing? Like, how do they get that job? You know, because there's people who are not as talented sometimes but they're more resilient and and some and and you just look at it you're like man they just hustled harder than everybody else and they're working hustle you got to hustle <laughs> right it's so but is that resilience that is not that is the that's the thing that I try to preach on the show so much is that resilience that you need to to handle the 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 those blows those as rocky balboa says take the hits and keep on and keep on moving forward I mean, 100%. That's what it feels like. I, I sort of feel like it's it's about tenacity and resilience. It's almost a war of attrition. Like, who can stay here the longest and take the most hits? And I, I genuinely feel like one of the reasons that I'm still here in this business is that, unfortunately or fortunately, I have a very high tolerance for other people's bullshit. You know, I just, I, I, I actually don't. It bothers me. But at the same time, I understand that you just sort of have to take a lot of bullshit in this business and like navigate it and keep, you know, figuring out how do you can make your movies, but also weather all the stupidity that surrounds you constantly. So, <laughs> now, and I'd love to just dig in a little bit on your comment is like, you know, it's, it's who's willing to stay here and continue to take the hits. That is the definition of insanity. Like that is literally like you don't see that in the cookie the cookie business. Like you know, <laughs> you know you don't see that. It's just like it's this constant, just constant thing. And I always find these, you know, because you've won in, in many ways. There is a lottery ticket mentality to filmmakers. Like the next one, it's like we're we're constantly betting on black or betting you know at the roulette table. Like the next project's the one that could blow me up. The next project's the one that's going to get me to the big gig. And the the dream of most independent filmmakers is to get a film into Sunday because back in the 90s that was what happened and you saw all of that success of filmmakers who got into Sundance and it blew their careers up and everything like that but is that kind of weird mentality of just always hoping that the next thing will blow you up and I found at least in my experience as a filmmaker I, I finally realized that I'm just going to do the work and whatever happens happens did you f kind of find have you found that kind of groove for yourself Completely. Yeah. But I also never really assume, I mean, of course, like getting into Sundance was incredible and a genuine surprise, I think for me and everyone else who worked on this movie who loved this movie and were so proud of it. But Sundance didn't necessarily feel like a realistic goal for us. You no, know, it was kind of a dream. And I, in some ways it is for everyone because it's so unlikely that you get in because it's so competitive. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I mean, even now, I certainly don't think like, well, I'm done. You know, like <laughs> I've ar- I have arrived. I have arrived. <laughs> I have arrived. Yeah. No, I think you're you're probably always feeling that. You know, every movie you work on could be your last. You know, and it's like. <laughs> <laughs> and it's it's so funny because I've talked to I mean I've and I've had the pleasure of talking to some very you know successful filmmakers on the show, uh, Oscar winners and all this kind of stuff, and they're just like you're only as good as your last project. Like just because you won the Oscar, or just because you got into Sundance, that will open some doors for you. But yeah. it th- th- you know the trucks of 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 money is not going to just come, and they're not going to just go. Well, you got into Sundance. Oh, how many projects do you want to do? We'll finance all of them and take as long as you need. Like that's not. <laughs> But a lot of filmmakers think that that's what happens. Like, oh, you got into Sundance. You're a Sundance film f- a filmmaker now. The door's wide open. The door's creaked open. <laughs> you know, and it's great. Don't get me wrong. It's absolutely great, and anybody would kill for it. But I just always like to, because I've had films in Sundance, and I've worked on projects with films, and I've seen what happens. Like, okay, great. It was awesome. Now, get to work. <laughs> no, exactly. And, and you have to have... I think a lot of projects going at the same time because inevitably yep. only one of the five will go through if you're lucky. So yeah, that's <laughs> also been kind of the thing that was difficult. Like I went straight from making VHS 94 right. into making Watcher. So I was trying to like finish up editing VHS while I was in pre-production on Watcher. And I had a script that I had been contracted to write for a studio. So all of this sort of fell on me at the same time and of course it's great like no complaints having things to do but also it's like in order to have a viable career and like to increase your chances you have to be involved with so many things but then of course inevitably you end up having to do all of them at once (laughs) right yeah yeah we could all wish for these problems like oh i'm too busy uh it feels terrible that i'm complaining about this no no but no but you're absolutely right but there's still a stress and a pressure to that you're like Okay, great. I just got into Sundance. Didn't expect that. Oh God, I got to finish this thing. Oh God, I got to do this now. And and now it's it, it, there's a lot of pressure on you. And I can only imagine, you know, being in the orbit of filmmakers who've been in Sundance, you know, working with them on on their on their projects. I see the pressure of what you know what you're know, like. Oh God, all this stuff. And you know, before you used to be able to go to Sundance. Now this year, unfortunately, we can't experience the Park City. Uh, have you ever been? No. No, I've never been. I've been, been like, I don't think it'll. I don't think it'll ever be what it was prior to 2020 again because I can't. I can't see sixty thousand, hundred thousand people walking in a two block radius. I mean, right now, yeah, that seems like a, a futuristic sort of dream. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. No, but and I always love asking, how did you get the news, and how did like what was? I always love that story because those are so much fun. Uh, yes. So it was funny, like. From the time we submitted, like every single week after, every time I got a call from my agents, I just braced myself because I was convinced they were calling to tell me that we didn't get in. Sure. <laughs> right. Of course. <laughs> but no, I got the news. Um, I think it was, I can't remember exactly when it was, but um, I was just at my desk working and I got an email from um, a Sundance programmer. I don't know if it's uh, okay to say her name, but I'll just say her first name, Heidi. And I didn't know her personally. I didn't know who this person was. I was like, who's this email from? And I look and I see she's a, like a senior Sundance programmer. And she just says, are you available to hop on a Zoom with me in like the next 10 minutes? And I was like, "What? Is- okay, surely they wouldn't be Zooming me to tell me I didn't get in, right? They're just right. going to give me the bad news through my agents. But I still wasn't like totally sure. So I hop on the Zoom and it's just her and me. And she gives me the good news. And I think I started crying. Oh, of course, uh, as you should. I would have cried. <laughs> <laughs> it was very overwhelming, but it was really nice. I love that they sort of, you know, they give you the news themselves and and one on one, and it was sort of perfect the way it just totally came out of nowhere. Yeah, you're um, just hanging out, and then you just get that call. It's yeah, that time of year during Thanksgiving. That that's that, that's that little two three week window where they start letting people know, and you're just like, and every day that goes by, you're like, I didn't get in. I didn't get in. I didn't get in. I did. yeah. And then like December 1st, you're like, I definitely didn't get in. I've had some people get a call in December, like early December, and they're like, oh my God. <laughs> but it's it's an amazing experience. It really is an amazing experience. Now, how did Watcher come to be? How did you get Watcher off the ground? Yeah, so um, I was hired to do it in 2017. And it was actually a, a fairly sort of 
you know, typical origin story and that I think the scripts came to me through my agency. Um, and I read it and they said that this company is hiring a director. They're talking to a handful of people. Um, and I just, at the time, I think I was a few years out of film school. I'd had a, one really pretty painful setback in my career and I was more determined than ever to land the job. So I'm pretty sure they just gave it to me because I like put together a 20 page presentation and just like, you know, <laughs> Reese Witherspoon in election style tried harder than everyone else. <laughs> and, like, <laughs> <you know. laughs> That's fun. Great analogy, by the way. That was awesome. <laughs> Nice, nice call back. So, so you basically was a work for hire. You just landed the job. It was initially, yeah. It was I landed the job. It was work for hire. Um, the script by Zach Ford was very interesting. It was, you know, the the core story was about this couple, Julia and Francis, who move into an apartment, and Julia becomes convinced that there's a guy watching her. But then, over the five years that it took, you know, for me getting hired to the movie getting made. Um, it actually, there was a, a significant amount of evolution. And I think the, the biggest evolution really was when the script initially was set in New York City. I heard uh, pretty you know late in the game that we were going to shoot in Toronto and then that fell through. And then they talked about shooting it in Bucharest in Romania. Um, and I just decided to totally embrace that and rewrite the script to take place in Romania, um, which ended up being... A real creative blessing uh, because mm-hmm. it kind of took the narrative in this in this whole other direction that really just sort of helped you know bolster uh, what was already there in terms of the emotional journey of our protagonist and just helping to increase her sense of isolation and alienation and you know suddenly she shows up and she can't speak the language and um, it just brought this whole other level to it so it was a uh, yeah it was a very interesting evolution over over those five years. But. I was going to ask you how Budapest came to be because it was kind of like that's very unlo- it's uh, do you normally New York LA you know kind of place but it actually added such a level uh of just another texture to the whole story that really made it stand out for me when I was watching it. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I mean it was um you know, I think there were some budgetary incentives certainly okay. shooting Mania, the way, yeah, it's it's a very common, uh, common destination. Partially for that reason, but also because you know they have the infrastructure there to make good movies. They have really good crew, and I think the financing company had worked in Romania before, so they had experience there. So there were a lot of practical reasons to go shoot it there. Um, and then I, I really did, uh, you know, I tried to absorb everything I could when I was there. I'd never been to Romania previously. I'd I'd lived in in Russia, so I had at least some former Soviet Union experience, but Mm -hmm. uh, Romania was new to me. But it was great because I really was able to sort of like infuse little details into the script based on experiences I had in pre-production. Like there's a scene where Julia goes into this beautiful sort of museum and she Mm -hmm. gets chased out by this angry security guard who's screaming at her in Romanian and she doesn't understand what he's saying. That literally happened to us. Like we went... (laughs) That location, like that actual location, and I take out my phone to take pictures, and this guy just comes running out and screaming at me. <laughs> wow. We, we actually, that's the guy who's in the movie. We cast him. <laughs> <laughs> You're terrifying. Like, let's put you in the film. Um, he was cooler then? After you offered him the, the, the part, he was a lot cooler? Way cooler, but the greatest thing was that I think he clearly was really nervous because he wasn't an actor. So the first few takes, he wasn't he wasn't like doing the thing that he had did to us in in person. But we eventually we got him there. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's amazing. That's a great that's a great story. Now I did notice that this film had a Hitchcockian vibe to it. Was he an influence at all when you were making this? Absolutely. I mean, definitely from a pure narrative perspective, like Rear Window, I think, was massively influential on this movie. You know, mm-hmm. it's it's sort of, I think, like directly referencing it in many ways. Sure. Um, and visually as well. And I think we're all trying in some ways to emulate Hitchcock in terms of, you know, his ability to create tension and suspense. Um, so, yeah, he, he was a reference. Um, David Fincher was a reference. Uh, I could see that. Yeah, I could see yeah. the Fincher-esque thing in there, no question. 
Absolutely, yeah. Um, there is a a great uh, Japanese movie called Perfect Blue by mm-hmm. Satoshi Kon, which actually ended up being quite influential as well. It's about like a Japanese pop star who's being stalked by one of her fans. Nice. Um, so yeah, there there were um, quite a few uh, influences, and I, I hope that you know they came together in some way that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> now, as a director, you know when we're on set. Um, we're, we're, it's such it's such an interesting thing as as directors as artists we don't get to practice our craft very often uh, actually directing it's mostly years of getting things off the ground unless you're Ridley Scott then if you're Ridley Scott you're directing all the time <laughs> you're doing Gladiator and like Black Hawk Down and like some and other movie. House of Gucci The Last King Aliens like he's doing a th- all of them at the same time um, but generally speaking we don't get to do it very often. And when we're there, I always find I'm like, it's the ha- I'm the happiest ever being on set. It's just like, ah, oh, it's great. Yeah. Is there, and there was, but with that happiness, there ha- comes that day where you feel like the entire world's coming crashing around you. You've lost a, you've lost a, like she's, la- everyone lis- who's listening, she's laughing. Because <laughs> she, the second I said that, she's like, you mean every day? Uh <laughs> But there's that that specific day that you feel like you lost a location, actor broke his leg, (laughs) the sun is, you're losing the sun. What was that for you in this project and how did you overcome it? I'm laughing because I'm thinking of like seven or eight different days. (laughs) (laughs) Well, a couple, a couple then, that would be good. Um, okay, so... The first one I think was because of a variety of of scheduling issues, obviously scheduling is always a nightmare in indie film. Like you put COVID on top of it, it (laughs) it gets like 50 times harder. So for scheduling reasons, I think on our, on day four, we had to do this massive scene, which takes place at the end of the movie. And is probably one of like the heaviest emotional moments for our two lead characters. Um, and it involves all these extras in an indoor space. So there's mm-hmm. the whole COVID thing on top of it. Um, and it just was a very, very difficult night. It was also a night shoot. So I think we were shooting from like 5 p.m. to 5 a.m. So just a lot of difficult circumstances. And again, this is day four on my first feature film. So I'm also just, you know, trying to get my bearings in some way. Um, so... That was very hard, and um, in without going too into detail, I think you know because of that level of stress on every single person in the production, there was a little bit of drama. Um, no, on a set, stop it. A little, a little bit of drama, um, and I, I, I feel like I, I you know, got through it the way that you usually do, which is to sort of just grit your teeth and like, you know, ride it out and try not to get too rattled and try not to let it make you too emotional. Because I will say like, like genuinely women on set, especially when you're in a position of power, people don't, will not give you a lot of grace when it comes to showing your emotions, you have to be very careful about it. You have to, in a way that, you know, I'm sort of making a movie about that, you know, like Julia has to do the same thing. It's just constantly sort of modifying what she feels so that people won't, you know, write her off as lacking credibility. Being a female director, you're kind of doing the same thing. So I think it was really just a matter of, in some ways, unfortunately, I have a lot of practice with that. So, but it still is very difficult. And it just, you know, you had to sort of like take a deep breath and like make sure that as much as possible, in spite of all the drama, we were getting through our day. Um, and at the end of it, it did feel fairly miraculous that <laughs> we we made it. You made your day. <laughs> Yeah. Which which is interesting because I mean, I've had multiple female uh, directors on the show and I love talking to female directors because it's a perspective of, of directing that I don't have. I'm a Latino filmmaker, so I have that perspective. But, you know, I've never dealt with a lot of things that female directors have to deal with and vice versa. Is there any advice you could give a, a young female director listening right now or watching right now on how to deal with 
difficult situations on set because look, I when I was coming up, I was always the youngest guy in the room. That's that's not the case anymore. Uh, <laughs> but I was always the I was always the kid in the room, and I would walk on some of these sets as a director, and you know you'd have the 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 the, the grizzled you know sixty year old grip. <laughs> who you know who, who's like this kid doesn't know what he's doing I'm, or or the dp that is going his own way or things like that it was difficult for me to deal with that coming up i could only imagine what it'd be like it, it was especially in the i came up in the 90s it's not the same world for female directors as it is today it's gotten better from my understanding is there things that you can give any tips on how to maneuver those for female directors or even just young directors who just when you've got a dp who's like yeah, I'm going to shoot it my way. What are you going to do? What are you going to do about it? You know, or production designers like, nah, I don't think that's the way to do it. And like, and you've got to, you've got to kind of show some teeth. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you do. I mean, I think my, my advice would be, I, I find it very difficult to stand up for myself and advocate for myself as an individual. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I think that's not uncommon with women. For whatever reason, we've sort of been taught not to do that. And if anything, I think we're sort of, it's ingrained in us to try to make other people around us comfortable, mm -hmm. right? And that's not what you need to do when you're directing a movie. <laughs> but what has really helped me is sort of telling myself, okay, I'm not standing up for myself, Chloe Okuno. I'm standing up for this movie that I'm trying to make. So the movie, like the movie that you're trying to make, the thing that is going to exist at the end of the day outside of you in some ways, that becomes a thing that I'm just like, I'm protecting this. And it doesn't really matter what people think of me. I'm, I'm standing up for what I believe is right for the sake of this movie that I'm trying to make. It almost becomes like a separate entity, like a little baby that you're trying to protect. Okay. <laughs> that makes sense. That's a, good, that's a good way of looking at it. Like you, you separate yourself you take yourself out of it, and now you're like, no, I'm the mama or the papa bear of the of the movie. Yeah, yeah no, exactly. And and even doing that, it's still very hard, you know. And it's always hard when you're a director because you're working with people who are experts in their fields, and you are not. So they're looking at you like, what do you know? It's your first movie, you know, or, That's... or you know, I've been doing this so many more years than you have. But truly, like, I really find first of all. If I make the wrong decision, I'd rather it be my wrong decision than me accepting someone else's wrong decision and living with that, you know? Oh, that's, yeah. that's always better. Mm -hmm. um, but also, I really feel like, you know, the thing that directors have that no one else does is we've lived with the movie for probably years. Like, we know it inside and out. We should know why we're making a certain decision. It's not kind of... For other people, it might be isolated, but for you, you're taking it within the context of the entirety of the movie. So how is production design going to work with cinematography and the actors and everything else that you've planned to tell this very particular kind of story in the way you want to? So it, it I find it constantly challenging every day to have the sort of confidence to tell people what I want, especially when they give me a lot of pushback. But that's sort of... I feel like for me, like that's the essence of the job in some ways. Yeah, and I mean, and I, you know, I forgot that this was your first feature, so you had that to deal with. And how did you get from, you know, how did you get your agent from shorts? Because I know a lot of people listening are like, "This is your first, you know, everybody wants their first feature. Everybody wants to get their first feature gig, especially a work for hire, is unheard of. You know, you normally have to build it all yourself and find the financing yourself and get cast by yourself and all this stuff. So this is a very unique scenario. How did you get your first agent and how did that process go from from shorts? Uh, yeah, so I got it. I, I had a the short that I made coming out of AFI was called Slut and it was like a coming of age horror movie, which did pretty well on the festival circuit. So I, I can't even remember exactly how they saw it, but they saw that the movie uh, my former agency and reached out to me and wanted to rep me, which was incredible. Also something I wasn't necessarily expecting from my film school. Um, so that's how that happened. But like I said, you know, that was in 2014 and it's now 2022 and I'm you know, only now premiering my first feature. So that tells you how long it took to get to this point. Even with it, even with agents, even with agents, even with agents. Yeah. That's the thing that a lot of filmmakers and screenwriters need to understand is like, just because you have an agent doesn't mean that you're going to just be working all the time. 
Oh, no, no. <laughs> Oh, no, no. Even with agents, I think you, you know, you still have to really be pushing all the time yourself. You got to be hustling. And, and they might open some doors for you, like this opportunity that presented you yep. with the watcher, you know, and, and you were, you were, <laughs> you electioned it out uh, and, got the, <laughs> and got, and got it. Now, going back to, I think it was Full Circle, your first uh, short film that kind of made the rounds? I guess that, well, Full Circle was a, uh, not exactly. So when I was 19 and I had been like working as a PA on all these indie sets, I made this little movie called Birdman and I didn't know what I was doing. It was one of those ones where I like wrote it, produced it, directed sure. it, edited it. And it, it's a miracle that it even got made because it was just me stumbling around in the dark. But yeah, there was that one. And then when I was at AFI, I made a few shorts, one of which was Full Circle which hasn't really been seen because at AFI, your first year, you make these shorts, but they're sort of designed to be done very quickly for no money and you don't get the rights to anything. So they can't really be distributed or go to festivals. Of course um, not. Why would they, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so was there a, were there some major takeaways early on in your career that you kind of brought into your careers? Because I remember one big first first time I did my commercial reels. This is back in the '90s where I, I shot on 35. I hired two DPs. There were two DPs on set. This is how bad this situation was. I've never had any ever since. And the professional crew that was hired, they're like, "Why are there two DPs? Like, why?" <laughs> they owned a grip truck, and they had access to a film camera. So I say, "Well." If they own the gear, they must know what they're doing. <laughs> Mistake that I never, ever made again. And that was something I brought in from those early days of me starting out as a director. So is there anything that you brought from those early days doing your shorts? Yeah, I, I never want to produce something that I'm directing at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> you said, no, I'm good. I'm good. Yeah. I mean, it, it was probably, it was a good experience, but no, I mean, it's just like directing, if you're really lucky and you have good producers, um, you know, they're the people who allow you to focus creatively because just that, just the creative focus takes up a hundred percent of your time. So when you're trying to like make the movie, but you're also thinking about like when craft services is going to arrive, it's just not conducive to I'll, I'll, t I'll tell you what I've most of the things I've done I've also produced and I agree with you like and there's been times where I've been in work for hire I'm like oh this is so much easier it's <laughs> you mean I don't have to sign checks during lunch <laughs> like it's insanity that is it's so hard yeah I don't know how you continue to do it because I did it once like on a tiny little no budget movie and I was done <laughs> I think for me, it's just I didn't have a choice. I didn't have a producer. So I was just like, well, I got to do it myself. I came from Florida. So in Florida, there wasn't a plethora, you know, mm -hmm. of, of filmmakers that I can work with. So I was just like, all right, I got to just sign the checks <laughs> and right. pr and produce it and get it done myself. And it, it was, oh, God, horror stories, horror stories growing up during that time. But but, you know, it's the shrapnel. It's the shrapnel that you, you gather along the way, and it makes you who you are as a filmmaker. And, you know, looking back again, I always like going back, especially when we start when you're starting out. Is there something that you wish someone would have told you at the beginning? Not in a way to dissuade you from being a filmmaker, but to actually help you on your path. Like if you could go back and say, listen, Chloe. It's gonna be. It's gonna take you twice as long and twice as hard as you think it's gonna be. Now you really should think about being a lawyer. But if you're not, if you're gonna go down this path, this is this is probably something to look out for. Oh man! I mean, honestly, I'm sort of worried. I'm even now making mistakes that I'm not aware of. You know what <laughs> yeah. I mean? Like I'm a little reluctant to go back and give myself advice when I feel like I'm still sort of in the thick of it. Like ask me again when I'm 75 and I've done a couple more movies, but. <laughs> Um, I don't know. I mean, I'll be very honest, like a thing that has been sort of very difficult and surprising to me is that, like you said, you would assume that the easier thing to do as an independent young filmmaker would be to get your own movies made as opposed to getting hired to direct something else, being a director for hire. I've actually found it's been the opposite for me. I'm a writer director. And I write scripts that I guess are, uh, 
I think accessible, but also they cross a lot of different genres. And I don't know, for whatever reason, I found it very difficult to actually get those scripts made. And I've found it easier to get hired on projects, um, which like you again, it's, it's just, it's upside down world. But um, I don't know what my advice is because I haven't figured out how to fix it yet. But I guess it's just like... <laughs> one piece of advice, I think is wear good, wear comfortable shoes. Wear comfortable shoes. That's always. <laughs> That's great advice. Yeah. <laughs> wear, wear comfortable shoes. Have a lot of pockets. Pockets are essential. You remember those pictures of those directors, especially commercial directors, had that vest on that they had like thousands of pockets and they could stick them in the back. And you would just look at them and like, and they, they were always khaki pants with tons of pockets. And you're just like, wow, that's, is that what a director wears? And then when you're on set, you're like, yeah, that makes so much sense. Yeah. I always wear khakis. I always have pockets everywhere just because. I'm shoving stuff in all over the place. Like, here's my shot list over here. Here's here's the schedule over here. And I'm just constantly, oh, yeah. Unless, again, unless you're Ridley Scott. Uh, <laughs> Ridley Scott released his own director's jacket, I think, right? Did he? Of course he did. Why Why wouldn't he? I, I just adore Ridley because, he. first of all, he didn't give a crap when he was in his 40s, which was, by the way, his first movie was in his early – his very first feature was, uh, I think he was 40 or 41. But by the time he made that first feature, he had directed 2,500 commercials. Oh, wow. So yeah. he was a professional. Right? I mean, he more proficient and more time on set than all the masters working at the time. So he was very proficient at it. Same thing for Fincher. Same thing for like Bay and Fuqua, these commercial directors. They just constantly worked for decades. Uh, but, but him and Tony both did that. And then they got off the ground with uh, with their with their directing. But now I don't know Tony. I think he's just rushing against the clock because he's just like I need to make five movies a year. <laughs> I know. I really respect it. Yeah, I've heard that. So we were so lucky. We had the most amazing colorist on Watcher named Stefan Nakamura. It was, it was gorgeous. It was gorgeous. We're, we're, yeah, I mean he he did. He and my DP Benji uh, Kirk Nielsen both did amazing work, but. Stefan has worked with Ridley Scott. You know, he he was the colorist on The Last Duel and on House oh. of Gucci. And uh, I hope I'm not talking out of turn. But yeah, he told me that, you know, Ridley is one of these guys who shoots with multiple cameras. Um, but the five, thing that I... Five cameras, I heard. Five cameras at the same time. Yeah. Five cameras, you know, doesn't like to do a ton of takes. But also the really big thing that I took away from why Ridley is able to move so quickly, aside from just being a genius and being in the business for decades, is that the actors show up and immediately respect him. You're not going to get any pushback when you're Ridley Scott, even for movie stars. So I, I think that's probably helpful. <laughs> and, and you know what? That is, I've noticed that as I've gotten, look, I'm, as I've gone a little bit, and I'm a little older now, and I've been doing this for a little bit longer. When I walk on set, I'll still get a pushback sometimes from someone older than me. And I have no, I definitely don't have the reputation of Ridley Scott by any stretch of the imagination. Nobody has the reputation of Ridley Scott. But yeah, at a certain point, you, if you made enough movies, they just know like, oh, he, he or she knows what they're doing. And you know, you know, but I still remember the day I walked on a show, on the TV show I was doing, which I was producing and paying everybody out of, like I was the production company. And this first AD didn't know who I was. I didn't hire him. And he started giving me crap on day one. And I'm like, dude, like am I, 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 my DP I've been working with forever, my product, my um, my line producer I've been working for, and the line producer hired him because it was a last minute hire because my, my first AD was booked. So I was like, okay. And this guy just started giving me crap. I'm like, dude, come here. Come here for a second. Just pulled him aside. I was like, if you don't like the way I'm working, you can leave. I've been doing this close to 30 years and I could do the show without you. And after that, and I go, oh, and oh, by the way, I'm paying you. Uh -huh. After that, it was very smooth sailing. It was very calm, quiet, just chilled. And he was like the best friend. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. That's amazing. I mean, I would love to get to that point where I can just take someone aside and very quietly tell them that, I'm better at this than you are. Shut up. <laughs> like, I'm like, dude, I, between me and my DP, we can run the set, dude. We don't need you on this production. This is not the last duel. I don't need yeah. you. If you're going to give me attitude and, 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 and be toxic on the set, like, which I don't need that. But by the way, also congratulations on being nominated for the grand prize. 
the grand jury prize for Sundance I saw on your IMDb that you were nominated. Oh, what? I, I didn't, I, this is news to me. Well, congratulations. Well, listen, I just saw it on your IMDb that you got, it says nominated for grand jury prize at Sundance. So isn't it all, aren't all the films who are in competition nominated? I don't know. If how they are, if they there. are, enjoy it. If they aren't, enjoy it. But if I saw it on your IMDb. I was like, oh, that's very cool. Love it. Amazing. <laughs> I'm glad I could give you that news. I know, breaking news. Thank breaking you. news right here. Now I'm going to ask you a few questions I ask all of my guests. What advice would you give a filmmaker or screenwriter trying to break into the business today? Oh, um, my advice would be to, like I said, it, it could sort of backfire in some ways, but um, don't be too precious, first of all, because there is no perfect project. Um, and you would be shocked. I think even sometimes if you're a director and a script comes to you, that's not perfect. Or if you're a writer director and writing your own script and you just feel like, okay, it's not citizen Kane yet. Don't be afraid. I think to put it out into the world and don't be afraid to take on jobs that maybe still need some work because in this industry, things always, a lot of times they take a lot of time or they happen in like a minute. It's one or the other, but, um, you can, you can evolve things. And I just think, you know, there's there's a lot of potential in projects and there's a lot of pressure on young filmmakers to do something that is sort of perfect their first time out of the gate. And, you know, on second and third time filmmakers, you know, you're only as good as your last movie. But I, I would just say don't get too caught up in that and don't let that psych you out too much because I think to a certain extent, I, I spent a lot of years um, so fearful of making a movie that was bad it probably prevented me in some ways from taking opportunities that would have been good. So that would be my advice. It's great advice. I, I, yeah, before I made my first feature, it was always like, oh, I have to be Reservoir Dogs. It has to be El Mariachi. Yeah. It, has to, it has to be color. It has to be this thing that blows up and it's not. Yeah. <laughs> That's an anomaly. <laughs> Just do the best work you can and move forward. Um, now, what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film industry or in life? Um, I'm still continuing to learn to, um, we, I mean, we had just such a long conversation about it before. Um, but I really am still learning to stand up for myself and to trust my instincts. And, um, you know, every single day you're sort of confronted with a million different decisions as a director. And if you're, person like me who's kind of anxious and tends to overly intellectualize everything like every single one of those decisions even if they seem really small and unimportant suddenly feels like it could make or break your movie and maybe that's true but it's probably not true um and I think it's just like ev literally every single day I direct I'm I'm having to push to believe in my instincts and just believe in myself and um I don't know if I'll ever fully learn that lesson because I think it's part of the process, like going through that struggle. Um, and maybe that's what makes things interesting. Like there's an inherent tension there. Well, I'll tell you what, don't feel bad because I've talked to some of the biggest people in the business and they all feel the exact same way. The imposter syndrome. It's a it's a real thing. I think it's just inherent of being an artist. Uh, it, so it happens to all of us. <laughs> when I hear, when I hear that, when I hear certain Oscar winners going, yeah, I don't know if I can write this. I'm like, dude, you just won the Oscar. What's wrong with you? Like, yeah, I don't know. I still can't. I don't think I could do it. Uh, and last question, three of your favorite films of all time. Ooh. Okay. Um, Harold and Maude way, way oh. up there. Yes. Uh, alien. Also probably my favorite horror movie of all time. Mm hmm. Um, and then the last one, oh God. I'm, I'm going to say Once Upon a Time in the West. Oh, nice. Very good. Yeah. Especially that opening sequence. Oh. The opening sequence. <laughs> like, I think that opening sequence and also the sequence where they're like at the well and mm -hmm. like the get shot and the music that like Ennio Morricone score. It just, there, oh. there was something about that that just sort of like changed me when I saw it. So. That's great choices. Chloe, thank you so much for being on the show. I wish you nothing but success uh, and congratulations again on being at Sundance. Enjoy this moment. It does go fast. 
just, just enjoy the ride because it's going to be a fun ride for you. So continue success, my dear. Thank you so much. Thank you.